Hello, this is Michael Edwards, CEO at BioMPO Solutions. This video is part six in a series I am doing on crowdsourcing coronavirus data. In the previous episode, we looked at some of the pathways and biogroups that were overrepresented in our day one post infection signature. We identified some potential inflammatory signaling pathways that go up that are associated with a bad outcome with COVID 19 infection. We also identify groups of genes going down with infection, representing an important cellular organelle, the peroxisome, that is involved in lipid peroxidation and viral sensing, among other functions. In this section, we will analyze our day one infection metasignature with a pharmacoatlas and base space correlation engine to look for drugs and compounds that can have an effect on the genes that change with coronavirus infection. Before I get to the interpretation part of my video, I just want to say that everything that's about to come out of my mouth is all me and may not necessarily reflect the opinions of my collaborators or of the companies whose software I demonstrate in the videos. I also want to say that no one's paying me to do this, but I get plenty of help from the people on my title slide. Thank you, Jim, Joe, Enrique, and Mehdi. One of the really useful functions with the base space correlation engine is the ability to compare your gene signature to all the other gene signatures in its database. As part of their enormous database, they have collected the results from many, many studies where they use chemicals or compounds in the experimental design. These chemicals and compounds cause changes in gene expression that we can then compare to our own list and see if there's a significant correlation to changes we see due to virus. For example, we can take a closer look at our top hit monophospholipid A, or MPL for short. MPL is the biologically active part of gram-negative bacterial lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, and is also a toll-like receptor 4 antagonist, and is typically used to elicit an inflammatory response in target cells and tissues. We can see that the correlation is positive to our list, meaning that the majority of gene expression is in line with what we're seeing in our metasignature which is what we would expect given that both conditions stimulate the immune system. We can also see that there was one study that the platform used to make this correlation. We can click on that category and get details on the comparison as well as take a closer look at the genes that were common between our two studies. Once we do that, we can see that out of 2,969 genes that changed in their study, 1,355 genes were common to our list at a probability of 1 times 10 to the negative 123. We can also see that the vast majority of these common genes changed in the same direction in both studies, with 565 genes going up and 653 genes going down in both lists. The probability of obtaining these results by random chance is extremely low for both, but you'll notice the p-value is actually lower for the group with less genes in common. The correlation engine algorithm takes into account gene ranking and the proportion of genes in each list that go up and down. The list of genes that go up that are common to both lists have a higher magnitude of change compared to the genes that go down, which means they're ranked higher, and make up a smaller percentage of the total genes. Therefore, the probability of obtaining these results is lower than what we would see for the genes that go down. Given this comparison, I would say this bioset is very similar to our gene list in a positive way, and therefore MPL would be a good candidate to elicit a similar transcriptional response to that of SARS-CoV infection at day one, if that's what we wanted. We can also export the gene results from both studies for this comparison to further dr drill in on what genes changed in the same direction and what genes were different. Uh, we can go back to our original list and see some of the other chemicals and compounds that were correlated to our day one metasignature. I should say right off the bat that the overall goal of this pharma database search is to find chemicals or compounds that reverse the changes in gene expression we're seeing in infection. But I think you can learn a lot by seeing what mimics our viral metasignature. It is possible that there are particular medications, and I've seen some common medications on this list, that exacerbate the host response to the virus that clinicians should be aware of. If we look at the compounds that have a positive correlation, it's no surprise that most of these are substances that are known to elicit an inflammatory response in mammalian cells. We see that most of these substances are things associated with either bacteria or viruses that can alarm immune cells. 
Right here we see this poly IC shows up on our list, which is a synthetic version of double-stranded RNA that mimics viruses to the point the cell actually reacts like it has encountered a virus. Even the substances on here that are not inflammatory typically have LPS or some other inflammatory agent in the comparison, like we see with ganipin, a substance that is believed to be anti-inflammatory, but in the study, we find that this chemical was administered with LPS as well, which was our top positive, positive correlated hit. I want to stress that it is very important to look at the actual studies before determining whether this particular compound will have an effect on our meta-signature genes. This database is well annotated, but there still could be the problem of multiple variables in a given comparison. The one substance that pops out at me that doesn't have a confounding variable is nickel. If we look at this study, we can see that the gene list produced by this compound produces a very significant correlation to our signature in the lungs of both knockout and wild-type mice. I dug a bit into the connection of nickel and virus, which is scientific talk for I googled it, and found some very, very interesting manuscripts. There is a huge connection to metal ions and viruses, with the former serving as an important partner in determining survival and pathogenesis of many viruses. Metal ions help facilitate many viral processes, which include maturation of genomic RNA, activation and catalytic mechanisms, reverse transcription, initial integration process and protection of newly synthesized DNA, inhibition of protein translocation, and this is done through the M2 protein, minus and plus strand transfer. They also enhance nucleic acid annealing, activation of transcription, integration of viral DNA into specific sites, and also act as a chaperone of nucleic acid. As far as the specific relationship of nickel to viral infection, it has been shown that higher levels of this metal in the human body are correlated to higher infection rates for HIV, among other viruses. I also note that in mice infected with a Kosaki virus B3, they show increased accumulation of nickel in the pancreas and wall of the ventricular myocardium that was not observed in non-infected animals. So obviously this virus is manipulating this ion for some purpose. It has also been noted by several research groups that infection rates and severity of symptoms seem to be worse in polluted areas. And it makes me wonder if maybe heavy metals, which are often a component of industrial waste, are contributing to this trend. What I've just shown you are the compounds that mimic the effects of the SARS-CoV virus on the host. But what about the drugs and compounds that may inhibit the effects of the virus? Given below are the substances that had the opposite effect on the genes that changed early in infection. Again, I was very surprised by some of the things that came up as possible therapeutics on this list. Again, you should always check the studies these correlations are based on before making any conclusions about its ability to affect your target genes. As an example, you might think it's odd that cytokine shows up at the top of the list in the negative category, given that in the previous section, on biological interpretation, we showed that there was a ton of chemokine and cytokine signaling in the lung response, and that the vast majority of it was going up. If we take a closer look at the studies this correlation is based on, we can see that the cytokines that have a negative correlation are all anti-inflammatory, like interleukin-4, or promote the production of blood vessels. We can also see that interferon gamma, interleukin-2, 12, and 18 show up as positively correlated to our list, which we would expect based on seeing genes associated with these signaling pathways overrepresented in our signature. Again, this was the last episode. Below the category cytokines, we see the TNF-alpha inhibitor adalimumab, I hope I said that right, which is coincidentally in phase four clinical trials for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, this drug is typically used to treat immune system mediated diseases, which kind of makes sense. Uh, we also see another TNF alpha antagonist, infliximab, uh, showing up pretty high on our list, as well as the anti-inflammatory drug dexamethasone, which coincidentally is also in clinical trials for COVID-19. Um, dexamethasone is also known to inhibit TNF among 
other inflammatory molecules. As we discussed in previous sections, TNF, along with interleukin-6, is associated with the cytokine storm that is associated with so much host tissue damage due to COVID-19. Could these TNF-alpha blockers help prevent these bad immune responses? As we can see by this graph, when the coronavirus invades its target cells, they produce proteins that signal the immune system to take action. The immune system can respond in several different ways. One, by inducing the adaptive immunity, which produces antibodies that eventually clear the disease. Or, there's a feedback loop with the innate immune response, believed to be driven by interleukin-6 and TNF, where you get hyperinflammation. We can see that the expression is highly elevated for both these immune signaling molecules in our signature, with the highest increases being in the infection signatures from the older animals with the more severe strain of the virus. We can also see here on the left a ton of TNF-inducible genes, with the vast majority of them going up at day one of infection, with the more severe signatures again having a greater change for these genes. It's clear that TNF is central in this response and maybe blocking it will prevent bad outcomes with infection. The fact that two of these three TNF blockers that are on our list are currently in clinical trials for COVID-19 and one of them is actually in phase four trials suggests that this might be a viable therapy route. There are a lot of drugs that show up in the negative category that I wouldn't necessarily expect to find that affect similar genes to viral infection we see butylbenzyl phthalate, or BBP, shows up pretty high on our list. BBP is used in some types of plastics and is considered a toxic substance by the European Chemical Bureau, so I was very surprised to find it negatively associated with our signature. One group found that this chemical can suppress type 1 interferon responses, which is definitely present in our host response metasignature. I wasn't able to find many studies that mentioned BBP and virus with a literature search, but I did find that a group took out a patent on decreasing viral transmissions using phthalate chemicals, which I thought was very interesting. We also see a drug, isoniazid, I hope I said that right, that is used to treat tuber tuberculosis show up pretty high on our list. This compound is used to inhibit the formation of the mycobacterial cell wall, and therefore I didn't expect it to show up in our viral response screen. I found a lot of studies looking at the effects of this drug on treating people with tuberculosis in HIV-positive individuals, but I didn't see much in the way of preventing the virus. I did run across this study that showed a delayed onset of HIV in individuals that were positive but asymptomatic for the virus. I also found several articles that suggested that this compound increased lipid metabolism, which was one of the pathways we saw in the last section that was downregulated at day one of infection. I don't show this here, but a quick look at the genes that were affected by this drug show lots of immune genes downregulated with treatment. It is possible but that the negative correlation is based on this drug reducing the chemokine cytokine response that are elevated at day one of infection. If we look down the list of anti-metabolites, we see the drug simvastatin, which also affects lipid levels by inhibiting the rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis. Again, we see drugs that affect lipid metabolism have an effect on the same genes altered with infection in the lung. There has been a recent push to potentially use statins in the treatment of COVID-19, as evidenced by this paper. Which, lit, which gives a list of studies showing positive results on not only bringing the immune system under control during viral infection, but also inhibiting viral replication in the early stage of the disease. The studies using simvastatin are indicated with a red arrow in the table on the right. This drug was the eighth most commonly subscribed medication in 2017, and I think it would be very interesting to see if there were any differences in infection rates compared to similar individuals not on the drug. If we look further down this list in the enzyme inhibitor category, we also see the president's favorite malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine, shows up in this category as a potential negative regulator. The mechanism of action of hydrochloroquine against SARS-CoV-2 has yet to be fully elucidated, but it is believed that this chemical affects the pH and intracellular compartments and organelles that normally require an acidic environment for proper function. We did mention that the peroxisomes in the last episode and its role in redox balance in the cell. 
maybe this drug helps with that function. We can compare our infection metasignature at day one directly to the biosets from the hydroxychloroquine study using the meta-analysis function to get an idea of some of the types of pathways and biogroups that this drug may be impacting during viral infection. The first column is our genes upregulated or inhibited on day one of SARS-CoV infection followed by the genes that change in the blood of patients due to hydroxychloroquine treatment ch challenge with group A streptococcus and due to drug alone. Red indicates the relative number of genes going up and green represents the number of genes that went down in this category for each bioset. We can see that genes associated with the immune response like interferon and innate immune signaling are going up with SARS-CoV infection, while these same genes tend to go down with hydro hydroxychloroquine treatment, especially when also challenged with streptococcus. I also note that genes associated with, this, with the metabolism of lipids were shown to be inhibited due to viral infection in our metasignature, but these same genes tend to be upregulated with drug treatment. Whatever the actual mechanism of hydroxychloroquine, it does appear to reverse many of the host gene responses we see due to virus at day one of infection. I want to stress again that all of these compounds are based on a very early signature infection and therefore these same substances may, have the, may not have the same effect later on down the line. Hydroxychloroquine may work well to prevent infections or provide relief very early in the infection process, but as we'll see by day seven, the correlation to our infection signature goes way down for this drug. Maybe this is one of the reasons hydroxychloroquine didn't do so hot in the recent clinical trials because it was administered at the wrong time or maybe on the wrong patients. It can also have very nasty side effects like death, and therefore it would be very nice to find a substance that is better tolerated by the body, like maybe some of the antioxidants listed below. One such natural occurring antioxidant, among many of its other functions that caught my eye and is ranked the same as hydroxychloroquine, is the compound beta-cryptoxanthin, or just crypt cryptoxanthin for short. If we look at the study that, this is, that is the basis for this correlation, we can see that the overlap between our list and the genes that change due to cryptoxanthin is quite significant. Not only that, but the probability that we would see the opposite change in direction in both conditions is very, very low. I also notice <clears throat> that the genes that were ranked high based on the magnitude of change in our metasignature seem to be going in the opposite direction with 12 weeks of cryptoxanthin supplementation. Given these promising results, I decided to dig a little deeper into how this compound could be antiviral. Beta-cryptoxanthin is a carotenoid found in fruits and vegetables. It is also one of the most common carotenoids with high concentrations in human serum and tissue. It is inversely associated with many life-threatening diseases with various benefits, including anti-obesity effects, antioxidant activities, anti-inflammatory, and anti-cancer activity. It is also known to be a precursor of vitamin A, which is also known as retinol. I wasn't able to find any details on how this compound becomes vitamin A, but the graph given here shows another carotenoid with a very similar chemical structure, which is beta-carotene, and is a target for the same type of metabolic enzymes, and therefore the conversion to retinoic acid is probably similar. Eventually, retinol becomes retinoic acid and helps initiate the transcription of many different genes important in functions related to our day one post-infection metasignature, like cell prolifer proliferation, protection against oxidative stress, regulation of cytokine production, modulation of the innate immune system, and the induction of adaptive immunity. It should also be noted that we find the expression of the gene alcohol dehydrogenase, the enzyme that converts retinol to retinol aldehyde, is going down in our metasignature. So maybe taking vitamin A once you've been infected with a virus may not be do you any good if you don't have enough enzymes to convert it to its active form. There is a well-established connection to the active form of vitamin A to peroxisomes, a cellular organelle we found to be strongly influenced by viral infection in our metasignature. In the previous episode of the series, we discussed the antiviral pathway associated with the mitochondrion peroxisomes, which is given here. 
we can see that one of the sensing molecules for this pathway, RIG1, is actually induced by retinoic acid, hence its name retinoic acid inducible gene 1. There are lots of other connections to the immune response with this metabolite that I wish I had more time to go into. I also note that retinoic acid is known to stimulate PPAR gamma that has been shown to repress obesity and insulin resistance, two conditions coincidentally known to have increased susceptibility to the current SARS-CoV-2 virus. It is also known to control lipid metabolism, which was a biogroup we observed to be going down on our day one post-infection metasignature. Based on all these connections of vitamin A and its precursor cryptoxanthin to viral response and its ability to reverse these changes, I would recommend that people worried about coming down with this disease get high levels of this compound either through supplementation or through their diet. Way more healthier than some of the other stuff that's out there. I'm not the only one that thinks vitamin A might be good as a preventative measure for the current epidemic. Given here is an excellent review paper by a Chinese research group that also found vitamin A as a potential therapeutic against COVID-19 based on a review of many studies. It should also be noted that we also found vitamin C and E in our list of negatively correlated compounds, but they weren't ranked as high as cryptoxanthin. What I just showed are the chemicals and compounds that show a correlation at day one of infection. The substances I discussed previously should be given to either try to prevent infection or administered very early in the infection process, like after being exposed to someone who was known to have the virus without having any symptoms of your own. But how does this list change by day seven when most people would be aware they are very sick and would look for relief? What we find is that this list changes quite a bit. Given in this table are the top 20 negatively correlated compounds to our infection metasignature at day one and day seven. If we look for common drugs or compounds between these two lists, we only find dexamethasone and the statin trichostatin A as the common elements. In future episodes in this series, we'll take a closer look at these differences between the various, various stages of infection and discuss some of the compounds that might show some efficacy in treating the disease in the middle and late stages of infection. Um, I do not think the secret is to find one drug that works for everyone at every stage of the disease. Based on what I've seen with the SARS-CoV virus in our meta-analysis, I would say that as you would expect, the host response changes the longer it's exposed to the virus, and therefore your targets change based on the sta stage of the disease. We are also working with animal models that were bed bred to be genetically identical, and people are not like that, so there will always be outliers. Remember, we use both young and old and more severe strains and mild ones. I would expect our signature would be very representative for the average infection, but there will always be exceptions. This concludes part six of our crowdsourcing coronavirus data series. In the next section, we will compare our day one post-infection metasignature to signatures derived from other diseases to further define and characterize this infection. We will also use it to compare the changes we observe in the host response to SARS-CoV to some of the host response data coming out from the current epidemic. I don't want to spoil it for you, for you, but there is a very significant correlation to our signature and what we're finding out about the current strain of coronavirus. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care and uh, try eating some butternut squash or citrus fruits if you want to up your concentration of cryptoxanthin. See you later.